probably quite wise to do that by uh, video. I came here for two years, and now 26 years later, I'm still here. <laughs> so, smart move on your part. Uh, thank you all for coming, and I promise not to use words like endogenous and all that kind of stuff. We have a fundraiser at the university, the recently retired Anne Hansen, and she always gives me the advice when you're talking to patients and families, stow the fancy science talk. So I'll do what I can. And also thank you to Danae and Margie for actually bringing this about. So, conflicts of interest, as Margie mentioned, we are working with Taranagula Venture Capital. And actually, we've advanced. They've actually signed the licensing agreement now. So we are moving forward. And the bulk of my funding has come over the years from the William Hummel HCU Research Fund. So um, East Hummel Kaufmans represent. Thank you very much. And we've now actually got money from the NIH. Last two years, our, a lot of our research on Formate has been funded by the NIH. And we did get a grant from HCU America. So thank you for that as well. Okay, I don't think I need an overview for what's supposed to be a 10 minute talk, but we'll probably be 12. So, what are we here for? What is the McLean Lab here for? There are two main reasons. One is that we want to better understand how the inactivation of CBS leads to the clinical problems that you have in homocystinuria, because we think that's key to the, the second aim, which is design and test new and improved treatments for homocystinuria. And we particularly want to do this, if we can, by ending the need for methionine restriction. And the reason for that is I firmly believe, and this chap here with a salad in front of him will agree, that nobody should have to put up with a diet that is severely restricted for protein. Okay, so law being what it is, we're not allowed to grab you off the street and start experimenting on you. So we need a mouse model. And I've been explaining, the, and I've been telling the same joke for 20 years, so I'm going to stop. But it's the human-only HO mouse model. I'm not from here. I didn't know what ho meant, okay? <laughs> but we made a, a new mouse model. I'm not going to tell the joke. Okay. <laughs> not all rodent models, though, are an accurate re rep recapitulation. There's, maybe that's one of those fancy science words. They don't show the same problems as the human disease does. So it can be a problem. I'm only saying that because obviously I'm very proud of the fact that our mouse model is the only one that has a hypercoagulative phenotype. They clot three times faster than normal mice in the same way as homocystinurics. They respond biochemically to betaine. They're the only mouse model that does. And some of the things that are wrong with them get better if you lower the homocysteine with the betaine. And they've got impaired learning and memory, so they've got cognitive impairments, and we can improve that. They've got osteoporosis. And a good mouse model shows you the things you already know about the disease. A great mouse model shows you things you didn't know were going on in the humans in the first place. And this one, the last three, are things that are going on in human homocystinuria that we didn't actually know until we found them in the mice and then tested in humans. This is going to take too long for me to do because Danae's already threatened me once. I'm pretty, sure I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm going to be 12 minutes, but if you call the cops, I'll be done before they get here. So... <laughs> There are some liver problems that we predicted with the mice and that we later found in a rare subset of human patients. This one I'm really happy with because we found that there are some oxidative stress-induced chemicals sticking to proteins in the tissues in our mice. And when we looked in human homocystinuric tissues, and this is from some poor chap in Prague who fell under a bus, and like the vultures that we are, we <laughs> circled around and got hold of his tissues. But when we looked in his tissues, we found they've got the same problem. They've got those same chemicals sticking to proteins and targeting cysteine residues. And this is how homocystinuric patients get the Marfan-like skeletal abnormalities and the lens dislocation. So, we are, as, as a summary of what we're looking at in terms of mechanism, we've got five candidate pathogenic mechanisms for cognitive impairment. We're pretty sure we know now how we get the marfanoid skeletal abnormalities and the lens dislocation. We've got two candidate mechanisms for osteoporosis, and more excitingly, we've got six candidate mechanisms for cardiovascular complications. And we've got 27 candidate proteins from the aorta, from a microarray, oops, fancy science words, to investigate as possible markers for a clinical efficacy in a phase three clinical trial. Because as it is, the FDA will not accept just homocysteine. They need to see some markers of clinical progress. Now, you might think, well, yeah, okay, that's lovely, but why are you doing that? And the reason is you generate a model, and this is a model that we generate of how oxidative stress would go through into uh, uh, different steps and then cause the clinical problems. Once you know how something gets broken, you're on the road to fixing it. 
And one of the things that came up is an amino acid, or a sulfinic amino acid, called taurine. Okay. It was originally uh, t uh, isolated from ox bile. That's where it gets the name from, as in taurus. But um, you can impress people at parties with that knowledge, I'm sure. But homocysteinic patients, you can make taurine for yourself in your own body, but it comes from cysteine. And so the pathway is blocked in homocysteinuric, so you can't make it for yourself. But it's a very powerful antioxidant and anti-inflammatory. And the problem, you can get it from your diet, but the problem is most foods that have a significant amount of taurine are off limits. Basically, it's seafood, fish, meat. So yeah, there's lots of taurine, but they've got a lot of methionine too. So we did a, a number of pa papers, we had a series of four papers where we looked at from tissue culture through animal studies and then a human trial. And we published this in 2019. And what was interesting is there is a phenomenon in a cardiovascular problem called endothelial dysfunction, which means the blood vessels don't respond the way they're supposed to. And that happens in homocysteinuria and it predisposes you to thrombosis. I'm happy to say that taurine completely fixed it and it's completely cheap. No company is going to develop it for you because you can't patent it, but I can give you some advice on how much taurine you should be taking. But it had a positive, a very positive effect. It had no negative side effects and it's completely safe. So, but it's not enough. How can we improve upon methionine restriction in betaine? I'm gonna skip over this. You all know about betaine, you all know about the protein limited diet. And I'm going to say a little bit about how some ideas come about. I wrote a paper saying in the discussion section that I thought we should be able to improve how betaine works, and if we did it well enough, we might not have to rely on methionine restriction or maybe even replace it. The reviewer that got, and was a very, he's not here anymore, but he's a very senior guy in the field, and I really like him, but he was incredibly negative. And he just said, it's not possible with what we know. And I thought, all you know about is the wild types. You don't know about it in homocysteinuric. And so I disagreed with him. I, I hate to come across as disagreeable, but I am, which is why it comes off that way. And I thought, I can think of some good reasons why we could improve it. One of the things is we, with our mouse model, which responds to BTN, we noticed it lowered homocysteine very well in the first week. But after six weeks, it was going up again. And then I talked to Harvey Levy in Harvard. Apparently, he's a big fan of alliteration. But um, he said, yeah, betaine's great, but it doesn't last. And I thought, OK, so what's different between week one and week six? What has changed? That's telling us something. And then there's another part. Sally Stabler, who I work with and have been working with for 20 years, was showing me some data about how badly betaine works with the remethylation disorders methionine synthase and the cobalamin disorders. It only lowers homocysteine by about 15%, which is a bit pathetic. And something goes on in that, those remethylation disorders called a methylfolate trap. Now, I'm not going to go into that too much, but it limits the ability to make a folate species called tetrahydrofolate, THF. Okay? They have this trap. They can't get very much of it. And I, th I was thinking THF has a crucial role in the betaine reaction. So that's probably why betaine doesn't work very well. So we're on the road. Plus, when somebody tells me, oh, well, you know, we know that's not going to work. I always remember the, my mother died of, liver, of um, lung cancer. But I remember her telling me that the doctors had told her that smoking is very good for relaxing. <laughs> and as you can see, getting your kids on Coca-Cola early is a great idea. <laughs> so... We started off with this hypothesis. If we could improve betaine treatment, can we get it to the point that we could relax or even get rid of methionine restriction? And that would be a massive improvement in patient outcome and quality of life. So to do that, you need to understand a little bit about the betaine reaction. If you look on the right, there is, B there is betaine, and it gets converted to dimethylglycine. But that dimethylglycine is like a choke point for the reaction. It's like the exhaust from your car. If you don't get rid of the exhaust, the engine's not going to work. So what happens is this dimethylglycine actually sticks to that enzyme, BHMT, and stops it from working. So if you can clear or improve the clearance of dimethylglycine by this enzyme, dimethylglycine dehydrogenase, you would probably improve the betaine response. If you look on the left panel, you'll notice that all those steps for the removal of dimethylglycine, every single one of them needs THF. It's telling us something, if we were but listening. So, I'm going to skip the next slide, because I, I honestly fear today. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Despite the crucial role of THF in the remethylation of homocysteine, 
The impact of homocysteinuria, classical homocysteinuria, on what folate and one carbon metabolism is largely uninvestigated. Now, as an unchecked tide of immigrants, there was an English chap called Gerald Gall, who's one of the early pioneers in homocysteinuria, and in 1972 he said, what is needed now are detailed studies of the types of folate present and their pathways of interconversion. Well, it's easy to say. I'd love to tell you that the scientific community rose as one and enforced their efforts on it, but they didn't. Nothing happened. And you might think, well, you're part of that. And here's my excuse, because that's me in 1972. Um, while I'm not doing anything, if you look at my face, you can see I'm clearly thinking about it. <laughs> okay, so. Then the question is, well, why has nobody looked at one carbon metabolism? I came to this conclusion three or four years ago, and I'll tell you why, because it's bloody complicated, that's why. It's really, there's literally hundreds of multiple forms of folates. They're subdivided within the cell in different compartments. There's lots of enzymes that cause, you know, back and forth, and some of those enzymes even stick together. That's the bad news. The good news is, at the expense of my personal life, sleep, and general health, we have actually completed a full study of the protein expression. All these little black boxes are the enzymes in folate metabolism. And all the little gray boxes are all the different metabolites. We have studied the responses of all those enzymes and those metabolites in the presence and absence of treatment. And quite frankly, I need to lie down. I'm not going to give you all of that, because that would uh, break the rule of no fancy science talk. But these four enzymes here are crucial manufacturers of THF. And for some reason, they're all repressed in the liver of homocysteinurics. There's also an accumulation of another folate species that draws away THF from the pool. They're an enzyme that actually repairs THF when it gets oxidized, that's repressed. An enzyme that actually breaks down uh, folates, that's induced. It's beginning to look like someone's got it in for you and it looks like a conspiracy designed to limit THF levels and by extension, the efficiency of betaine. So, that's all indirect. It's not a trivial thing, because this is a very fragile metabolite, but eventually, in collaboration, we managed to measure THF. And you can see it's about 60% down in the liver of homocysteinurex. It's nice to be right once in a while. So the take-home message from that is, with betaine treatment, we may well have been driving with the brakes on for the last 50 years and not have realized it. Okay, so that's the bad news. But you know what? The bad news is often good news in different clothing. Because once you know what's wrong, you can maybe try and do something about it. So we hypothesized that another compound called formate might boost tissue THF and thus turbocharge the betaine reaction. So we did this in a mouse model. And I stress this, pay attention, because it is the best bit. Okay, so if you look at the left-hand side, that is the homocysteine level, and we don't mess around with mice like with 150. These are mice with 300 micromolar homocysteine. If we give them formate, we can lower the homocysteine by about 40%. Pretty good. If you give it formate and betaine, you get it down to 20 micromolar, near normal. Okay? And that sounds good, but it's even better when you realize these mice are on a normal high-protein chow. They are not having any protein restriction at all. Okay? So it's transformative if we can get this working in humans. We have a gradual release formulation, and, and basically one dose kept it below this pathological um, threshold. Uh, the lower line, the red one, is one that we established in mice. The blue line is one from a paper that uh, Christine uh, Chapman did. But again, this is in the presence of a normal protein diet. So our conclusion on that one is that the addition of formate to betaine treatment has very strong therapeutic effects on plasma and, crucially, we've been looked in tissues. It's all very well fixing it in the blood, but most of the problems happen in tissues. And we've had seen evidence of normalizing effects in the tissues as well. Okay? And this is in the presence of a full methionine diet, and it may represent a highly significant advance. Now, obviously, I was taught by my parents, you don't put all your eggs in one basket. That's the diagrammatic of what can happen. So what else have we got going on? Because, you know, obviously we're not lazy. And as mentioned before, we've been working quite closely with PetroBio. We had a phase one SBIR, and I think we're 90% certain that we're getting a second one with a serious amount of money. And it's basically a bacteria that can digest the methionine in your gut. You ingest the bacteria with your food, 
And we did a we've been basically doing the animal studies on this, and we were able to show, yes, it does significantly reduce homocysteine. So in plain English, it means it mimics the effect of a methionine-restricted diet without having to eat one, which I think is a very admirable goal. And finally, in addition to taurine, formate, and petrobio, we have three new treatments in developing in homocysteinuria. The one in the middle, the company that I'm working with on that does not want me to go public yet. The one on the left and the one on the right, which put a significant dent in the homocysteinuria, those are naturally occur occurring compounds, and they are so natural and so simple and so safe, I'm still wondering if we can get intellectual property pro uh, on that. I don't want to have the same problem as we did with taurine, where no company's going to take it up because they can't make any money. But what the point of me showing you this is that all of these treatments are on a full protein diet, and they can be combined. And they could probably be combined with Vormay or with the taurine. So there's a lot of possibilities going on here. Okay, so this, if you've been in Denver before, this is what we're working for. There's an 80 foot statue, but down by the Performing Arts Center, and what we're working on is happy dancing homocysteinurics. And this is my lab, and uh, Hua Zhang came over from China. He's now an American citizen. Terry Bottiglieri, he's like me, he's from England, and he's now permanently in Dallas. And Sean Brosnan is an Irishman who went to England at Oxford and then emigrated to Canada. So uh, if you're hearing a lot about what a problem immigrants are, just remember some of us are actually doing some good things too. <laughs> so. <laughs> and I have one final point, and that is, Having a child or being a child or be, you know, having a family member with a rare inherited metabolic disease can be a very lonely and isolating experience. And I just want to let you know that's my email address, that's my phone number. I will talk to anyone till the cows come home about homocysteinuria, about how it, how it comes about, the pathophysiology, the pros and cons of existing treatment, the pros and cons of future treatment. I don't care how many of you contact me, I will talk to anybody. You're not alone. We're in this together. Okay, thank you.